Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. We are going to go through some exciting stuff, new features in the new versions we are releasing. So whether you are joining uh, live, at least in the morning where I'm at, uh, wherever you are in the world live, or in the future, maybe we have flying cars, watching the recording, always appreciate your attention. So we'll try to make this as relevant for you as possible and actionable so you, you get to know our new versions much better. Okay, so I'm gonna go through several new features, where they're located, how to use them. My name is Walt, I work on the sales and support team, so do a little bit of everything. One of the things is I present to you. Okay. So we're gonna go through looking at what is new in all new products that we are releasing. And just for reference, this applies to Fathom 13, Arrow 10, Impulse 10, and Extreme 3. So we are releasing those in the late uh, summer of 2023 to fall or winter of 2023. So it's we're releasing these uh, in that time frame again, just for reference. So we're gonna go through annotation changes, design alerts, layers is really the big one, but I wanna build up to it. We've improved some of our printing, looking at new valve window, custom junction icons so you can chain you know put in your custom stuff on the workspace and then improved isometric drawing so i hope all of these things you guys are excited about we've known to you know we've had to work on these things for a little while now and we've finally been able to do it and we're going to show you it and hopefully you're happy with it but then there are other things that are product specific so fathom 13 there's a new slurry model for my ssl users out there Arrow 10 has a new compressor functionality, and we also look at uh, sound calculations, so being able to report things in terms of decibels based on some uh, standards. Impulse 10 has transient checkpoints and a restart file. We will talk about more specifically what that means, but effectively a transient run can be uh, you can save any output up into a point you don't have to finish the whole run and you can start at a certain checkpoint it's very useful but again it's only going to apply to my transient users out there so for most of this webinar i'm trying to keep it general for everybody no matter what product you use and then we'll get into specific stuff so hopefully again this this also helps for those watching uh recording you can kind of skip through until the points you want to watch that are relevant to you and then extreme three is our final product we will go through the reciprocating compressor, a new compressor model, again, for the transient side of things. And if you don't know what each of these products do, Fathom is steady state liquids or incompressible flow, at least, uh, mostly liquids. Aero, steady state compressible. Impulse, liquid surge or water hammer, as some of you may know. And extreme is gas surge or gas hammer, we'll call it, but it's, it's gas transients. Okay, well, there's a lot. There's a lot to go through. But first, why not waste more of your time with a bad joke? Why did the computer catch a cold? It had too many windows open. And if I haven't lost you yet, if I haven't utterly disgusted you, thank you for staying on. We will get to the relevant content of course. Okay. Now, let's jump in the software. I'm going to be doing most of this from the perspective of Fathom. Because that's the most applicable product, it's what most people are at least familiar with. And again, all of these that I'm going through initially are going to apply to everything. So let's get started with annotations is first on the list. So an annotation, for those that don't know, is effectively like a text box or something you can put onto your model to add some flair to it, some labels, let's say. So that's what I want to do. In this example, we are going to be sizing a pump, going from low elevation. To high elevation, I want to pump through 500 gallons per minute through this pump, and I need to figure out what size of pump, meaning what head rise and what power and all that will, will accommodate that. So the first thing I want to do is add the annotation. Well, annotations have changed a little bit in the new version. So let me show you. If I click annotation tool, now you can see we have different options. So there are shapes for your annotations, which can be relevant, I know, for instance, as people are changing PNIDs, the cloud icon can be useful you know, to designate changes to versions. 
Uh, in this case, I am just going to do, let's do a rounded, no, nah, let's do an ellipse just for fun. Why not? So then you click it, you draw it. Now you'll see it used to be a separate window you open, but now it shows up in our quick access panel here to the right. Okay. So uh, this is now where you put in all of your settings. It has more functionality than before, but the way you interface with it is a little different. So the name, I'm gonna leave the name as annotation, that's okay. The text inside, I'm gonna say uh, sizing for 500 gallons per minute. And I say, okie dokie, and it shows up now. And I can decide where to put it, so I'll put it in the center. You choose things like fonts if you want to show the text at all, and many other settings that you know common shape editors will have. So I won't go through each of them because that would be well exhausting for you all. But one thing I will do is I will change the color from just a white background to let's do a light green, add some flair to it. Okay, and then you can also add arrows. So let's say I this, so if you want to show arrows, you can do that again, have an arrow at the beginning and you can decide where to put the arrow, uh, other settings like that, okay? Doesn't have to be a solid line, it could be dashed. Very cool. Okay, so again, you get there by putting the annotation on and even if you're in your normal scenario view, let's say you can double click it and it will bring you to the quick access panel here and it will have your selected property uh, shown here as the annotation, okay? So again, there you, you go, you just click it and it shows these settings. Neat, so I'm gonna move that, um, I'll keep it right here. And this is just a note for us to know as engineers what we're doing, you know, what's going on. Now, the next feature to show, again, this is gonna be kind of rapid fire, but I want it to be comprehensive and for you to be able to kind of locate specifically what you're looking for. Hope I'm not moving too quickly for you, but again, this is recording, so you can play it back if you'd like. And of course, with all of these, we also have resources available for you beyond just me telling you these things. So we have blogs, we have help topics, and of course, we've got our amazing support team here to be able to help you out if you have questions. Okay, so that's an annotation. Now let's do a design alert. For those that never use design alerts, then all of this will be new, and I'm stoked to show you it. Design alerts have been around, but we've redone the workflow to make it a little more smooth. So a design alert is something as a user you put into the software to let it know when to warn you of something. So it's kind of like a user specified warning, if you will. So it's best shown with an example. So here's our design alert manager, and I went there again, tools design alert. I'll click this add button to add a design alert. And what I want to be alerted of is when my velocity is above 10 feet per second, meaning if my velocity in this system is above 10 feet per second, warn me and say, hey, Walt, you might have a problem. So you choose a name for it that's relevant. It's going to apply to pipes because that's where velocities are seen. And I'm going to scroll down and choose velocity. Now I get to choose the direction of my threshold. So meaning uh, anytime it's greater than or equal to 10 feet per second, warn me. You can switch this to less than or equal to if you had a different kind of design alert in mind. And there you go, now it's all in. And now I decide what pipes to apply it to. So in this case, it's a fairly simple system. I'm just going to apply it to all of my pipes but you can get very specific and making these selections also can be done much easier with these options down here. But every pipe, I want it to flag when 10 feet per second is violated. So I can go ahead and run my model, say, cool, we can do the math. Oh, we can do the math, but it doesn't mean it's what, it's the results you want. So as you can see, I have these design alerts now, velocity is above 10, okay, well that's, I mean, it's it's getting flagged because the software read that the true velocity based on the calculations would be about 12 and a half feet per second. So we have a problem. So what we can do then is create a child and do uh, six inch pipes instead of four inch. 
this could be you know part of your design process so i'll just do these individually you could do global edit but there's only two of them so it's nice and easy to do uh just change the size right here okay so now the same design alerts apply in tools design alerts but well we'll see they don't get flagged because now my velocity is less than 10 i have successfully designed a system that i like five feet per second is reasonable to me as opposed to something above 10 where you get a lot of frictional loss and un, you know it's unnecessary okay so very cool just again a couple of new workflows that's all that was something that is completely new is what we call workspace layers so if you let's see i got this if you are in our software in Fathom 13 or Arrow 10, or any of those new versions, you will see a new tab down here, Workspace Layers, in the Quick Access panel. You will also notice that Visual Report exists, but then you go there and it says, whoops, it doesn't exist anymore. We're only showing it here because, uh, to kind of keep continuity with older products, but visual, everything about visual report has now moved to the workspace in layers. And there are entirely too many settings to show you about layers. And we have other specific resources for that. I'm just going to give you a quick overview and pretty much show you how you can simply add output to the workspace. I know that's been what a lot of people have wanted for a while is why would workspace and visual report be separate can we just overlay output on the workspace and yes now no you can so this is a, a kind of a, a quick diagram about what showing what layers is about if you've ever used things like photoshop or even microsoft products like powerpoint and all that images have there's a layer system to it where images can overlay you know an image can be behind something else text can be in front all of that and the idea is you can think about your interface as having these transparencies overlaid on one another so there's a lot going on in this case but if we just quickly walk through it we have let's say our base drawing in fathom our workspace what you are normally you know what you are used to seeing our all objects layer let's say then you can have symbols on top of that numbers on top cool flow and pressure output this is probably the biggest thing is you can show now output on top of your different pipes so you can see velocity directly on your diagram. And then color maps is another cool thing where you color map based on output. So above you know, 10 feet per second show red, below five feet per second show blue, something like that. That can also be now a part of your workspace as workspace layers. So best shown like anything else with an example. So again, way too much to try to show you every little thing. I just wanna show you how we can put output on our workspace. So if I navigate down here into my quick access panel to workspace layers, you'll see various settings here. What you have is a pre-created layer called the all objects layer. What this is, is it's just, it's everything that you you know would have been used to with an old version it's all objects you can't remove objects from this layer but you can't hide layers this is one of the beauties about stacking things in this manner with layers is you can show or hide various layers so if i press this little eyeball it goes away and that's because anything associated with that layer now gets hidden and i can show it show it again so you can maybe imagine how you might be able to you know add 10 of these things and show different portions for your report writing or when you're presenting to a client or something like that so you have one created this is default because and there's not many edits you can make on this because we need at least a layer that has everything so that you can also go find everything you have in case you get lost you get lost in the layers Okay, so what I want to do though is I want to create a new layer that displays my output. So what I'm going to do is press the plus sign here, new layer, a blank layer. I'm just starting fresh. I'm going to call it output. 
nice. And you can see now it's stacked on top. So now you can think about this again as a transparency over the original drawing. Now you may say, well, well, that's cool, but how do I add things to this layer? That's what this little gear icon, the settings does. And I, you can double click it or hit the little gear icon and it will bring up a new window. Again, there's a good amount going on, but if we just take it piece by piece, you'll eventually get used to this stuff. So the first panel is that you're deciding what to show on this layer. So you can see my pipe, my pipes are not being shown and neither are my junctions. Yet they're on the workspace because the layer underneath is showing them. But in this case, I like to compartmentalize. So I don't wanna show my pipes and junctions on every single layer because I like the idea of being able to shut some off and some on. So I wanna keep these hidden. Then I can decide what kinds of things to show. So what, sorry, what parameters to show, what output. So in this case, let's say I want velocity to show on my pipes. I want my pressure, we'll do static inlet and outlet, and I can choose my units here. So again, well, all I did was double click it, or you can use this arrow to move it over, but this is where I'm deciding what to show on my workspace. And this applies to pipes. I could do a very similar thing to my junctions. So in this case, what I'm curious about is this pump. So I will search, or you can just do this expansion if you wanna look through all parameters. I personally like the search function because I know what I wanna see. I'm gonna do head rise, double click it. I'm gonna do volumetric flow just so I already know it, but I want it to display again if I were to write one for this, let's say. And then I want power, pump power. Okay, now I get to decide what objects am I actually gonna show these labels on. So the objects themselves are hidden, but the labels I can still show. And I need to uncheck this box, force shown labels to match shown objects. So you see how there's nothing here? That's because I'm not showing anything here and I'm, I'm using this option to make those the same. If I uncheck that, then I can magically say apply the labels on the pipes even if the pipes aren't shown in the layer in this layer so i can click these little eyeballs and now you can see the output pop up and do the same thing for my actually i don't need to show it for my pumps cool now another thing about layers is this is where you decide where you're putting your annotations so my annotation i'm going to leave hidden on this layer because i'm going to consider it part of my all objects layer my base layer here so I'm gonna keep it hidden off this one. It still shows again because my all objects is on. Okay. So now, magically, the moment everyone's been waiting for, you have output on top of your model that you can also go in and change input and all that. So let's say if I, let's say I make this 501 gallon per minute. Quite daring am I, yes. You see it clears my results because I no longer have results because I put in different input, it cleared everything out. As soon as I run it and I say workspace here, it comes back and it updates with this new output from the new math I did. So I'm gonna go change that back to 500 just for the sake of our example, but you get the idea. So that's pretty neat. Again, you can use your imagination for how versatile this is and how much you could do with it. This is a very simple example, but probably the most relevant. A lot of people like showing output, so it's not like you have to get crazy with layers to get a lot of use out of it, but you can if you'd like, so you can show and hide different objects. So for example, something I wanna show you is another example I have built, which can emphasize the usefulness of layers. So this is a different example. This is gonna be about fire water. So it's a fire water system with a lot of sprinklers, and the story is, well, I don't want to see all of these individual sprinklers. I'm more curious about the big picture flow to each one of these rooms. You could think about these as rooms. And what you can do with layers is create them such that that is achieved. So I pre-made this. Again, I, I just don't have the time to show you how I did it. But you can see how I have various layers created. And I've included annotations on them. And I've also tied them to certain scenarios. So 
I strongly urge you, if you are curious about this functionality and making it, you know, uh, being able to get the most out of it, go check out our other resources. We have a blog, at least one, two, maybe even two at this point, and more to come. A couple webinars on it and our help documentation and our support team. So I strongly urge you to really go learn this functionality because it can be very useful. For, so another thing I didn't bring up was a color map. I'm coloring my pipes based on output. So this example is that any flow that's less than 70 gallons per minute is red. It's a visual indicator to me that, hey, this room is not getting enough water or what have you. Well, yeah, I guess in this example, it is water. It's fire water. So the usefulness should become apparent. And you can tie those again with scenarios and the other functionality of Fathom to be to create a very useful kind of uh, model, hopefully useful for reports and uh, presentation. It's, it's all about kind of workflow of that. So that's an overview of layers. I don't expect you to be an expert, but there's a taste. Again, down in the quick access panel, workspace layers, and it's just, it's gonna take you playing with it. <clears throat> Other feature to bring up. So now we're moving on to a new topic going to be in the same example because it's actually a good example to show you is how we've updated our our print functionality this is going to be a big one for a lot of people because i think it's been something we've wanted to do for quite a while is improve how the or improve the printing process so it doesn't seem so uh, so you have a little more control over it i'll word it that way as soon as you get into a new version in fab 13 or the rest of those that I mentioned, you will see a new little icon down here. It's a little subtle, so it's not overwhelming. It doesn't look that different, but this is new. This little print area thing, page setup, we call it. If you click that, there are some settings here that will help you as you prepare to print. So the first thing I'll, sh I'll note is that you can show your page borders. Now, if you look on the workspace do you see how there are squares i'm going to try to explain this the best i can right now based on my zoom level and my scaling this model is going to it's going to run onto two pages fathom is saying this is going to have to go onto a second page so i'm just going to close it and i'm just showing you the print preview it's like it's just a, a preview of what's going to happen now if i go to actually print look at my print preview do you see how part of this is cut off and then i go to a different page and it shows up here that's represented by those little page borders on the workspace it's telling you it's going to bleed onto a second page and again uh, well not again but you get to decide if this is a landscape or portrait oriented or oriented paper so right now it is portrait, it's vertical. So if I were to change it, you know, instead, let's say I wanna view it as if it was a landscape. Well, now it looks like everything fits. And that makes sense because we changed the orientation. If I go to page setup, or sorry, print it, and I'll need to, uh, well, I guess it just shows up right here. View it, do you see how everything fits? And it's because I changed my page orientation. It's really, help. I'm gonna go back to portrait. It's really helpful to just, for your own sake, use this scroll bar just to kind of get a grasp of what is what we mean by scaling. So if I'm zoomed, this is effectively zoomed. So if I'm zoomed in at 200%, this is what happens. I'm going to print this workspace onto one, two, three, four, five, 15 different pages pieces of paper. That's just how it's going to fit. And if you're curious, why does it extend all the way up here? Well, that's because <clears throat> I do have objects in that area. It knows they exist. It's just not being shown. So that's why my, uh, my print area goes that far. It's because these objects do truly exist. I'm just not showing them. And I guess that's probably a bigger thing to explain with layers is those objects exist. They're not gone. They're just gone from my, my eyeballs so they still exist for the math and all that fathom recognize it recognizes them as true objects so if i go in here and i scale down 
you can see, oh, there's a point at which it's so zoomed out that it does fit on a single page. Here at 41%, it will fit on a single page. So you go here. It's just going to be, you know, because it's in portrait orientation, it's going to be pretty zoomed out. And it will only print what is currently shown on the workspace, but it does know these objects exist, so that's the, that's the print area. If you wanted to define your own print area, you can say that right here, user-defined print area. You can check that box. And what this does, oh, I'll just leave it there, is it gives you, well, an area you can change the size of. So if I wanted to bring it up, if I wanted to bring this in because I don't have those objects here, they exist, but I don't want to print them, then you can define your own area like this, okay? The tricky part is it doesn't exactly you know, match the aspect ratio of the, the paper you're printing on, but you can still use this scale functionality to show if it's going to at least be on a single page or not. So right now it's going to show up on two pages. Do you see that little yellow line? Okay, and then I'm going to zoom in, which makes that second page disappear. So now we're at only 49% 49, 49% instead of 41 because again I got rid of this extra white space here. So if I go to print, now things fit a little more nicely. Doesn't have to be as zoomed in because now I did a user-defined print area, and you combine that with this scaling to see how many pages it's going to print on. And again, you can move this. You can't just drag it around, but you can move the borders so you can kind of like uh, you know walk it over in certain areas. So it's really nice, I will have to say, and compared to what seemed to be just Fathom deciding on its own what to print, you get to decide. And I highly encourage you using the borders and the scaling thing just so you can grasp what's happening. That's how I approached it was, oh, okay, this makes sense. Now this is going to be six pages, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's going to be highly zoomed in. Go print. And I can see that happening here on the uh, spade, the page list here. Or as I scroll down, you can see how it's kind of taken my model and pieced it up to six pages. One of which is completely blank, but it has to be square, so it grids it up, you know, in a nice way. So cool. I hope you are as excited as I am about that. It will help with your reports. I am certain of that. All right, now let's get back. Let's get back to what I call this simple example, this beginning example. So shifting gears, new feature, uh, a new a new new feature to talk about. So changing subjects from printing. Now we're going to talk about how valves have changed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, um, yeah, make a new scenario. It's a good practice. Added valve. <clears throat> So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna split this pipe with a valve. And you can hold shift on a junction as you drag it and drop it onto a pipe. And then it will ask you how you wanna split it. I wanna make it 10 feet from the pump. Cool. And you see how it, it cleared my output because no longer I have to now redo my math. <clears throat> so the valve as an object in the real world has not changed, but the valve as an object in Fathom and our other software has changed. So you'll notice right away as you open a valve, settings, uh, well, it's actually been simplified by bringing it onto a single window, but it might look like a lot. <clears throat> so the first thing to note is that there are various ways you can define a loss, meaning the pressure loss, the frictional loss. The first option is user specified. That allows you to enter in a CV or KV, a K factor or loss factor, a resistance curve, equivalent lengths or 3K Darby, usually it's useful for uh, layman or flow, but there are various models of loss that you can choose from and then enter. For a valve, CV is pretty typical. <clears throat> K factor is good uh, if you're getting it from a handbook or you get that from a manufacturer, but typically valves have a CV. The other options would be from a characteristic. This is where things get new. So if you choose from characteristic, what this means, first you have to understand what a characteristic, what that is. A valve characteristic describes 
how the valve loss changes with valve position. And we would refer to that as open percentage. <clears throat> so how open the valve is can be tied to a certain loss. So like again, most things, good to show an example. So from characteristic, you can type in your information. So at 0% open, maybe your CV is zero. There's no flow, let's say. And at 10% open, maybe your CV is at you know, 50. And you can imagine you can keep going up and you can get this from the manufacturer. This data should be available to you. <clears throat> now, if you don't have that because you work on an old system or you just, uh, you know, you need to make some assumptions, we do have pre-built characteristics, which is really cool. So in this example, I want to choose a ball valve where it's it's kind of this, either the path is open or it's not. And so there's not going to be much loss when it's open, but I can define a ball valve and a fully open CB, and we, we've gotten that information from literature, it will fill in a characteristic curve. So if my full open CB is 5,500, which is pretty realistic for a ball valve, because when it's completely open, it's in line with the pipe, there's pretty much no pressure loss. But you'll see it filled in a table for me. And that's because a ball valve has typical behavior we can try to rep, we can grab from so what you have is as the ball valve is really open you know there's not much loss right high cb if you start closing that valve pretty quickly it starts to restrict the flow because now it's you know as the ball valve is closing you are interfering with that flow a lot until eventually you know you're all the way closed and there's no flow because the valve is completely full closed so you're disrupting it causing a lot of friction early on and you can tell it then an open percentage so i want to say this valve is 90 percent open actually if it's a ball valve it's probably just going to be 100 percent open let's be real so 100 percent open valve say okay cool so this can be very useful especially for my transient users out there uh, when we get into um, needing to choose characteristics for valve closures for folks who are looking at water hammer and surge and all that. And one last thing I forgot to bring up is the handbook data still exists, so you can choose from various literature sources what kind of valve you have. So K factor is typical, and you can choose from ball valve, in this case, percent open, very small K factor, right? Makes sense. And it still uses my characteristics here, which only comes into play in the output when I say, because now I'm telling it a loss and it will report back an open percentage, an, an equivalent open percentage that would get me that. When I told it an open percentage, then it will use the table to get a CV. I hope I haven't lost you, but the, the basic idea is you can define your characteristics here and choose an open percentage. So if I reopen it, I've saved this, uh, I didn't cleared out or anything. 100% open, CB at 5,500. We also have a lot of resources on valve characteristics in general, if you are curious to learn more. Okay, I run that bad boy. Say, cool, now I can see my valve summary. Man, 0 0.008 pounds of pressure loss. That's not much. That's about what I expected though. Okay, and now again, we have our output. And do you see how pipe three was added? Now, if I go on my workspace layer here, I can see output. I'm now showing, I'm showing my output on pipe three because I drew it on this uh, layer. It knew to add the label to that pipe. So good to go. Okay. Something people have a lot of fun with would be custom junction icons. Again, moving on to a new feature. If instead of using this pump icon that we have told you you have to use, you can choose your own. So if I right click, let's say this pump, you can do customize icon and you can add an image. So if you if I press this and I'm in this webinar right here, I have this pump icon. Now I've already done that, but you just click it, say open. 
and it's and it now it shows up right here as a new icon I can use. If I check it and say okay, oh look at that. Now I can use my own icons. This one's a little. Uh, there's some I I stole it off Google, so there's some watermarks here, but you know hopefully the police don't knock me down. You can change the size of that icon with layers. So if I show here, if I open my layer, oh, I'll go down to my all objects where it's actually being shown, and my pump, I can scroll this up and blow it up as big as I want. I'll just leave it small because, well, let's do this, why not? And now I have a new pump icon. So you can do this with anything. What it does is it creates a new folder in your installation and saves that image. So if you ever share this with somebody, you also have to share that image. But I'm sure you'll run across that, you know, or you'll worry about that when it happens and you'll uh, have to look into it or give us a call. But the idea is the person on the receiving end also needs this image. The image is not saved inside the model file. It's it's more a, uh, it's a reference to, a, to an image. Okay. Now, something else a lot of people will be excited about too would be isometric drawing. New feature, we moved on. <clears throat> we've all, we've been able to do isometric drawing for a little while, but it was uh, time for an update, and that's what we've done. So first, I will show you how to get there. Right now, I just have a rectangular grid as my background, and I can go to arrange pipe drawing mode, isometric, and you will now see everything has changed into these 60 degree angles as an isometric drawing to represent three dimensional space on a 2D surface. So cool, The let me make sure I have it correct. The original way that you would do this in our software is you'd maybe drag out some junctions, let's put a pump down here and a I'll do a reservoir just for fun and a reservoir over here. And as you draw a pipe, we, do you see the little dotted lines, the red dotted lines? We try to predict for you where you want to go on this grid. And you would use the scroll on your mouse to scroll through options. So right now I'm going to scroll down. Boom. So scroll down now made uh, the isometric path different. So I'm just scrolling back and forth here. Because we would force you to be on the grid. You had to be on the grid somehow. And the best way we knew how to do that was we just kind of predict what's a logical path to go from point A to point B. So do that, okay. And then I would do it again from here to that reservoir. So again, I could use the scroll bar to go in a different direction, but you know, sometimes it doesn't necessarily predict the best way. So this is this is how I'm gonna do it. Cool. Now we have new options. So I'm gonna delete this. And if you go into arrange and go snap to grid, you can actually, instead of half having to be on grid lines and having Fathom or the other software decide for you, you can do snap to grid points is now a new option. And what I can do is I can, I can violate my isometric grid and it will snap to points, so single intersection. But do you see how now it does not show any predicted path? So I can just let go, and do you see how now it's just straight A to B, it's completely straight. It doesn't force you to do something. I actually really like this functionality personally because what I would do is I would go in after the fact, meaning I highlight it, and I would add a segment to it. Control, Shift, Y. And that, you know you do this often enough, you get used to it, you do it pretty quickly. And you drag the node to whatever isometric grid you want or point you want that little uh, that node to be on. And then the grid paper, the sorry, the grid in the background behaves more as a guide, as an isometric grid reference, where your end point will still end at you know one of these points here, but you can cross them if you'd like. And I like this because I don't want to deal with Fathom having to try to predict where I go. Instead, I just like to draw, I want to draw the pipe and then Control Shift Y, boom. 
and then put it down where I want it because it actually didn't do a good job of predicting uh, there before. I actually wanted this to be horizontal, not uh, come up vertical. So adding a segment after the fact is really uh, useful. You can get more pinpointed with where you're going. Now the third option in a range, snap to grid, do not snap, is very similar where it doesn't force you to be on the grid, but instead it doesn't it doesn't force you to snap to a single point. So do you see how I'm kind of in the middle here? Now the isometric grid is definitely just a reference and there's nothing about it that is forcing you to use it. So you can go wherever you want and it's now just like a I don't know, grid paper, graph paper, something like that where you do what you want, you don't have to use it, but it's there for, uh, for you to just to see, I guess. But in a similar way, you can attach object to object. And what I will do here is, oh, I'm gonna select both and I will add a segment to both. And then I can just quickly do it down. There we go, I keep losing it. And then down here, boom. So the more you use it, and combining with other functionalities, you will get a little quicker with it. But isometric now it has more functionality. It doesn't, you don't have to use what we predict. So if you're used to also using the alt and adding a segment to the end of it, that also works still. But again, the big, the big announcement here is that it you don't have to go where we predict. Okay. And you can add things after the fact. And actually, in this case, I don't even have to be on a point, right? If I don't want, but that's kind of sloppy. I like to be on grid points. So I'm going to use that option. There we go. Okay. Wow. Well, that ends the presentation on new features that apply to every piece of software. We're now going to move into features that involve specific software applications. Don't worry. It's not going to be as lengthy. I will just kind of go through quickly because I know not everything applies to everyone. The main thing in Fathom that is specific to Fathom is our new slurry model so for my ssl users my settling slurry module users we now have a uh, new slurry model for you to pick up on something a lot of people have asked for everyone's really excited about is what we call or what is known as the four component slurry model now i say it's product specific like it only applies to fathom but it does apply to Impulse too. So if you're an Impulse SSL user, it also applies there, but I'm still considering it product specific and I'll go through it in Fathom. So slurries are salt, you're pumping solids along with liquid. Cool. I think people can get that. If you're not an SSL user, you'll learn something today. So still stick around. <clears throat> the four component slurry model is a logical name because there are four components in this model so you have a carrier fluid which can include some solids but they're so fine that they almost become one with the fluid so that's a uh, homogeneous carrier fluid effectively then you have some particles that might be a little larger particles that are even larger and particles that are so large that they just kind of sit on the bottom of the pipe this might be a representation of let's say uh, sand or something like that where you might get some rocks in your sand and you have various sizes of your sand particles so when you when you're pumping it you can't really categorize every it's not a single you know single solid the solid has various characteristics to it because it's got a lot of variability or if you're in dredging or something like that where you're sucking stuff out of the ocean we're going to have a lot of variability so this model captures it and we've got the math for this model from um, a certain source, GI, GIW specifically, I have the help file right here. So again, something you can search yourself if you ever get lost. Our help file is actually supposed to be helpful. But we have this reference here to GIW, their pump manufacturer, and they have this testing lab that they their whole lives revolve around slurries. So they've figured out these models that are good to predict slurry behavior. So you can get a book on it. You can go to their class to figure it out. Their class is very good. I will give them a free plug. I went out there and they teach you all the slurry stuff. Anyway, so I can't teach you about slurries, but what I can show you is that is how to do it if you are already familiar. Oh, I guess 
along with the four component stuff, you do need to know. That means you need to know particle sizes and all that. Like we're not going to magically decide what your slurry looks like. You have to tell us what the slurry looks like, and then we'll do the math. The way you would do that is through, well, you have to test the stuff you're going to pump. So here's just an example I pulled off of Google. The idea is you kind of know what mass, you know, how out of out of a sample, how much of it is large and how much of it is small. And you can do that through sieves or other meshes. And there are specific ways to do that with slurries, but you you have to get to know this information in order to use the model. So you have to do some real testing. Um, so for most of my slurry users, I think you guys are comfortable with that. But I just want to give a heads up when you want to use a more sophisticated model that requires more sophisticated input. So what does it look like? Okay, well in this case, I want to be pumping. Uh, oh, I'm going to go back one. I'm going to be pumping 2,800 gallons per minute of slurry, which is uh, liquid and solid. How that looks in Fathom is in analysis setup. First of all, I have to have my slurry module on. Check. Can I decide a carrier fluid? Water. Check. Then I get to define a sol my solids. This is where you need, you know, you need to do that testing I was telling you about. I like to keep things in libraries because it, it's more compartmentalized. I can call it up at any time. So what I've done is I've saved my solids information into a library. And libraries is a whole topic on its own. We have resources on that too. But solids is just another type of library. The idea is I've defined things like particle density um, and my mesh, my uh, my sieving process over here. So particle size and how much has been retained based on my sample. So you're just doing a, you're giving it a profile effectively, solids profile. And it will use that information to do the math. And slurry definition, here is where I decide what kind of model to use. So if I Go over here, you can see slurry model is an option. We now have the four component model. That's what we're looking at. So you check that. You have to know how what percentage of solids you're adding and a sliding friction coefficient, which is about the that fourth component, which is where stuff is just kind of sitting on the bottom of the pipe and being dragged along and then affects pressure loss and all that. So that's what this coefficient is about. And so you define everything in this way. You define the solids. Again, it's going to be too in depth to tell you everything you need to know about the solids. Well, there are other sources to help you out with that, and then other general slurry sources also to help you out. Uh, but once you define those, cool. Now you run Fathom all the same. You just, okay, run it. The difference is now you get unique output. So in this case, I actually have a caution here that my velocity, what I'm pumping at, is, is lower than my settling velocity, meaning the velocity that is needed to keep all of my particles suspended. So I'm actually going to be depositing out at, you know, I'm going to get accumulation effectively in my pipe, which is not good. You kind of want to design not for that. You know, you want to design for everything to be floating and moving along. So you want, this is actually an example where you want, typically want high velocity, actually. Uh, unlike my other design alert example, you want high velocity to be able to keep these solids up. Not too high, so you are eroding your pipe, but high enough to keep them up. So this is just a, a, again, this is nothing specific to four component. This is just general slurry output in Fathom. It will warn you if there's a problem. But what was new is in the back end, this engine that Fathom runs on, now is accounting for all of these various components and adding up frictional losses from each of them and, and solving the network that way. So what you can do is, oh, cool. Well, I want to make sure I'm not depositing out. So I'm going to maybe pump 3,200 gallons per minute. Or an alternative is use smaller pipes, pipe size, run the model. And then you see those cautions go away. And we successfully designed a system that will transport my solid as I need it. Okay, 13 feet per second here is above my 12.3. So slurry theory, there's a lot to it I can't get into. But the four component for my, for my SSL users, my four component model is now available. Okay, well that does it for Fathom. Let's step into another product, AFT Arrow. It's the 
compressible flow sister to Fathom. Okay, so now I pulled up Arrow. If you didn't even see the switch, that's a good thing because that shows you how similar our interfaces and interfaces are between products. But here we have Arrow. So you can see that here in the top left and the reservoirs are tanks now because gas doesn't just stay in a reservoir, it stays in a tank. With Arrow, something new that we have added in is what um, is some extra compressor capabilities. So if I open up my compressor, we can now have a compressor map. And that just describes the compressor in a more full way. And you can operate it to different ranges for a compressor. So really all it does is it changes how you might put in your curve. So in Fathom, you have a pump curve. In Arrow, you have a compressor curve. Or now you have a map because compressors are a lot more complicated than pumps generally. So you can enter in your information. These mass corrected or non dimensional, they're just typically how people or how manufacturers report parts of their performance curves. Because again, compressible flow is a little more tricky and uh, it's not as simple as just, oh, pressure and flow, right? There's a lot to it. So you also then define a pressure ratio. So instead of a head rise, it's pressure ratio, okay? And then efficiency is just what you think of as efficiency, but you can enter all this information for various speeds. And then you have this fully defined compressor that can operate at various speeds and will determine the uh, you know, efficiency of it based on that data, based on thermodynamics and all of that. So it's it just expands your ability to define compressors. I will admit, I am not a compressor expert, so I, I don't even know all the specifics about each one of these variables. I'm more of a uh, Fathom Impulse user. We have other people here who are experts in that area, but they uh, have gone through and built this out for those of you that do model these intricate, compressor systems, okay? So compressor map is now one of those. That will also be relevant when I talk about extreme, by the way. Okay, so then you can run it all the same, and then you get compressor output, which again, will report various things to know about the compressor, such as, okay, the actual corrected RPM, the efficiency you're running at, the flow rate you're running at, the pressurize and all of that based on your curve and your system and where it's interacting. Another thing with Aero is that, so a new feature beyond compressors is that we have now sound power calculations. So when you move fluids through pipes and components, sometimes they get noisy, especially gases because they move so fast. They can cause vibration and sound and all of that. So we have actually incorporated detecting sound levels through components like valves. And that's based on standards again. So if I, well, I already ran it, I guess. I can go into output, you go into output control, or we could show this on a layer as well, but I'll just do it in output as another way to interface with this. In junctions, you can type in here, sound power level and add it add and it will show up right here sound power level and then in your output you can come down and see based on my flow through this valve i'm gonna it's at about 96 decibels it's pretty loud that on its own is not just sound on its own is good to know but it's mostly useful for knowing you know, if your valve is going to fail or it's so, it matches these criteria that make it have a high likelihood of failure, let's say. So you can, tr you have flow through such a valve and you can have conditions which include like pressure drop across the valve, its velocity and its sound and all of that. And it, you will come up with a warning that will say, hey, this is, this is looking like a not a good kind of sound. So you might wanna do extra calculations to check for your likelihood of failures. And then there's another feature we have to do those calculations afterward. 
In this case, we don't have that, it's just reporting, but it's nice to know when there could be a problem, Arrow is going to let you know, and then, oh, maybe that component is something I need to look into more specifically, you know, to do extra calculations on. So, very cool. Moving down the line, now we'll get into impulse. The impulse specific feature I'm going to show, kind of like SSL is actually not just specific to impulse, it's specific to transient software in general, which really is impulse and extreme. But what's really neat is that you can stop a simulation halfway through and see the output up into that point. So what I mean is I'm going to I'm going to trigger my output to be cleared. Uh, let's do uh, let's do something else. Do this eleven just so I can clear my output so I can show you from, from scratch. Move it back to ten. Okay, so right now I have no output. It's just a freshly defined model. What I'm doing here, for those that uh, don't know impulse, this might be a lot. All we're doing is we're running our fluid calculations through time. It's a transient solver. So our pump is going to trip. That's what's gonna happen. It's gonna lose power. So that's a transient event. <clears throat> so I've set all that up. I don't have any output yet. I can run my model. Oh, I need to do my sectioning yep, because I messed up the pipe length. And I will pause it. Oh, I try to get to 50, got 53, that's close. You can pause it and say cancel. And it will ask you, well, it was it didn't quite finish running because what I wanted to do is run this for 30 seconds in simulation space. But I stopped it halfway through at 15 seconds. So it's saying, it can keep all the stuff you did up to this point. Do you want to do that? I would say uh, yes. So it didn't run the full simulation, but I still get output. So if I go look at, let's say, a transient graph, you will see that it just stops at 16 seconds in this case, instead of going all the way up to 30. If you ever used impulse before, what would happen is you would get no output because it's kind of an all or nothing file. But now, if you only get through part, part of the way, you can stop it and then see up to this point. Very useful, especially if you have a long run and you're like, whoa, 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 I don't need to see all of that. I just want to see the first like five seconds, let's say. And instead of having to go change that in analysis setup every time, so you can see here I ran it for 30 seconds. So changing that, you can just kind of let it run and pause it. It's a little more, it's quicker to be able to check those things out. So neat. A second thing that's very related to that is I can create what's called a checkpoint file, where if I'm running the simulation at a certain point in time, I can create a checkpoint file. That file then can be recalled at a later time to say start from here instead of starting from the beginning. So if I run, I'm just gonna let it run the whole way and just let it, and let it go. So it went from 0% to 100%. So zero seconds to 30 seconds. A checkpoint file would be like, well, let's say at 10 seconds, that's about a third, make this checkpoint. And that way I don't have to keep running this beginning part because maybe that's where uh, you're only, you know, you're only interested in showing, let's say a colleague or something, stuff after that point, you can start your running your model after. And then another thing is you can tell it when to stop. So you can only do this chunk and leave this part out. Or let's let's erase that. You go beyond 30 seconds. You can also do that. That's pretty cool. So we'll show what that what, what that looks like. So I'm gonna say now let's go output workspace. So if I run my model, okay, and then I oh oh Ah, I'm trying to get 50. Pause it. I can go other actions and create checkpoint file. What this does is it creates a file along with your model in the same folder you have. Checkpoint has been created. Do you want to stop the run? Yes, why not? And so again, I have output up into that point, but what I can do now is I can go into analysis and say continue run from checkpoint, and it will not have to redo calculations from everything beforehand. So it's a nice way to kind of restart everything. 
or restart without having to go back to the beginning. So I can continue from file and it's and it pulls up this window, which is just telling you it's going to start from 17 because I wasn't good enough to get 15. And then it will go into 30 seconds because that's my amount. That's the way I've set it up. You can change this to be only 20 seconds or actually what's cool is you can go to even beyond what you've set in analysis setup as again a way for you to kind of more quickly uh, change what you're viewing, what you want to look at with this simulation. So I can say, okay, continue run and it will go beyond. So now 100% is no longer 30 seconds, 100% is now you know, 45 but it allows me to go beyond what my simulation would have otherwise done. So you can see here, if uh, it would have stopped at 30, because that's what I defined originally, but because I told the checkpoint file thing to go to 45, I went to 45. So what we're looking at is behavior, by the way, of my pressure over time, and it's going up and down quite slowly with this accumulator. So it's, it's absorbing the pressure waves is what's going on. Okay, so you can restart your simulation and you can also pause it halfway through and look at where you've gone to. With your checkpoint files, there are settings to it. So you can actually tell Impulse to automatically create these checkpoint files. So create a checkpoint file if there is an error. So if it, if it tries to get through 20% and there's an error, it will create a checkpoint file from that point on so that you can uh, well, first you can see what's gone and what's happened right before that, and then start again um, to see again like how, when is that error getting triggered and all of that. You can also do other kinds of checkpoints where you just tell it how often to do it by either time steps or time. Again, these are a little more advanced, but the idea again is you you can kind of shift your window of simulation around. Okay, cool, cool. Finally, last but not least, we have Extreme. This one is uh, Extreme for anybody, any Extreme users out here. It is calculation intense, so I actually won't be running a model for this example. I'll just be showing you some input uh, that is new with Extreme. So the new thing I'm showing you is going to be like Aero. We have new compressor settings. Yay. So a compressor can either have a map like we saw in Aero or a compressor curve, or it can be a reciprocating compressor or PD compressor. So if we open up our compressor, there's a lot going on here, but it's kind of pretty to look at, I guess you could say. We've added functionality to be able to define things about this reciprocating compressor, such as how these pistons are moving, how many of them are there, and how will that affect my flow rate? And it's only in extreme because this is naturally transient behavior, right? This crank is turning with time, pulling your gas in and pushing it out and doing that times six because there's six cylinders. So it will look at what's happening to your system from this reciprocating compressor doing this very quickly. And then of course, that's going to tie in to one of our modules PFA pulsation frequency analysis, if you have ever used that. That does is it looks at um, resonant frequencies of the system and are you matched at that and what happens if you are and are you meeting your API standards and all of that. So I won't get into PFA. I will just show you the PD compressor on its own as input. So you can see here, first the diagram, very helpful. It tells you, you know, where your this piston and cylinder combo is pulling in your gas and then what it will be discharging your gas and what that means relative to your input. So you have your crank angle and that's what is representing in this graph is as the crank is moving back to about, you know, about 180 and then it comes back around, it's now closing. So it's doing this times six effectively. And you get to define things about those uh, angles such as like, Okay, when does it actually start pulling in gas? Okay, it pulls it in at 10 degrees, not zero, but 10, because it takes a little bit to be able to pull in gas. And then it starts, it stops pulling it in at 170 and it starts discharging it at 200 degrees. So if you think about this as just a circle, 360 degrees, you can try to you know match the input to the diagram. 
And so it starts discharging, okay, until 350 degrees, and then it doesn't discharge anymore, again, just because it, there's some buffer there. You find things like bore, stroke, rod length, things, if you know your compressor way too intimately, that you would know. So you can put that info in here and we will look at the transient effects. I will say that I understand other software that tries to do transient gas flow does not consider the compressibility effect inside of the compressor like we do. We are actually looking at compressibility in the cylinders. We're not assuming the incompressible methods like a lot of other folks will. So it's a lot more realistic. And again, okay, well, something I find cool is you change the number of cylinders. Okay, you can see the behavior change. And again, that's going to change everything else about my system. Define your speed, define your, um, you know, other things about this compressor. Like I said, if you're way too intimate with it, that you would know. Okay, that is quite the mouthful for a webinar. But it's kind of it gives you a good representation of what's coming out in these new versions if you haven't already started to use them. So thank you for joining. But a quick a quick summary is that we went through what's new in all products, which was this list, annotations, design alerts, layers, printing, valves, icons, and ISO drawing. Neat. Then we went through product specific, but I will say squiggle, tilde, somewhat product specific because this still applies to impulse because impulse also has SSL and then transient checkpoints also applies to uh, e extreme because it's also a transient solver but I think you get the idea. Okay so I hope you're as excited as I am about all of these features and get to use them. Give us a call if you have any questions of course or send us an email we're always happy to talk and for that we have our contact information here so for any support information you can go here or give us a call and then sales if you are curious about well any of those things you saw that you don't have give us a call we'll help you out so appreciate everyone's time and attention i know it's the most valuable resource that you have and you chose to spend it here so thank you wish you happy in engineering and that you get to use the new features very exciting thank you all